Symbolic History Through Sight and Sound, 21, Milton, Mind's Dark Glory. The egotism of such a man, said Coleridge, is a revelation of spirit. He was not speaking of the Rembrandt of the 1629 self-portrait, nor of the Schütz whose lament for Absalom of the same year has a prelude for trombones, but of Milton, the youth Wordsworth imagined with his rosy cheeks and conscious step of purity and pride. Since childhood, Sirius, as his own Christ in paradise regained, to learn and know and thence to do what might be public good. Milton, who in the Nativity Ode, also of 1629, joined his voice unto the angel choir. His style, as he would say, by certain vital signs it had likely to live. What willful reason raise its God space through the palpable obscure? Thirty-two years later, Rembrandt, in age and increasing neglect, turned as often to his own deep-shadowed form, a lighted gospel witness, himself the Apostle Paul. While Schütz, in a Germany ravaged by thirty years of war, put off the lavish choirs and instruments of Venice to deepen in his passions the drama of solo song and choral motet. After the Civil War and its dangerous service, Milton, eyeless in Gaza under Philistian yoke, returned from They Also Serve Who Only Stand and Wait to his old promise to celebrate in glorious and lofty hymns the throne and equipage of God's almightiness. He wrote Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, and Samson Agonistes, though as earth betrayed as Rembrandt's Peter, after the arrest of Christ. Yet as Jove and Mercury graced the hut of the pious Philemon and Baucis in Rembrandt's pagan parallel for Christ's sacrament, Milton's dark house received the invocation to light, bright effluence of bright essence in create. <laughs> But thou revisits not these eyes that roll in vain To find thy piercing ray and find no dawn So thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs Or dim suffusion veiled Yet not the more cease I to wander Where the muses haunt clear spring Or shady grove or sunny hill Smit with the love of sacred song but chief these iron and the flowery brooks beneath that wash thy hallowed feet 
and warbling flow nightly I visit, nor sometimes forget those other two equaled with me in fate, so what I equaled with them in renown, blind Thamoris and blind Maonides. This Homer, to whom Rembrandt also turned in his last decade, and Tiresias and Phineas, prophets old, then feed on thoughts that voluntarily move harmonious numbers as the wakeful bird sings darkling and in shadiest covert hid tunes her nocturnal note. Thus with the year seasons return, but not to me returns day or the sweet approach of even or morn or sight of vernal bloom, or summer's rose, or flocks, or herds, or human face divine. But cloud instead, and ever during dark, surrounds me from the cheerful ways of men cut off, and for the book of knowledge fair, presented with a universal blank of nature's works, to me expunged and raised, and wisdom at one entrance quite shut out. So much the rather thou, celestial light, shine inward, and the mind through all her powers irradiate. There plant eyes, all mist from thence purge and disperse, that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. As the angel to Rembrandt's Matthew, Milton's heavenly muse, dictates to me slumbering, or inspires easy my unpremeditated verse. If Baroque self is peculiarly a revelation of spirit, it is that from these Miltonic satyrs, as in Jenkins' fantasy on one theme, the tensile world orders itself in light and shade, like God's sensorium in Newton's query. So the tactile flows from the night-lighted Magdalen of Georges de la Tour, conceptual as in the meditations of Descartes. Impossible to doubt that I am in this place, seated by this fire, clothed in a winter dressing gown, that I hold in my hands this piece of paper. Yet like others, I sleep. I have dreamed I was in this place, clothed and before the fire, when I was naked in my bed. Though now I am awake, it is with conscious deliberation that I extend this hand. I see light, hear noise, feel heat. Suppose one says these sensations are false. It cannot be false that I think I perceive. Take this wax, just come from the hive. It has still the sweetness of honey, the smell of flowers. It is hard, cold, can be worked. When struck, it sounds. Let it be placed near the fire. Its flavor exhales, its odor evaporates, its color changes, it loses its shape, becomes liquid, struck, it does not sound. Does the same wax remain? No one doubts it. Something remains, extended, malleable, movable, an intuition of mind. Let me close my eyes, stop my ears, turn my senses from things, efface them as empty and false. So in inward gaze I will seek little by little an awareness of what I am. I am a thinking being and possess in myself an idea of God, the thinking cause of my being, since what is cannot be produced by what is not. Once I have discovered that God exists and that he is no deceiver, it follows that whatever I see clearly and distinctly must be true. With such clarity I see that the certainty and truth of all sciences rests on the knowledge of the true God. As in Velasquez's 
kitchen scene with the picture window of Christ, Mary and Martha, the daily is secured by the divine presence. We know from his first biographer that even Descartes' method had the seal of prophetic dreams. Again in Velasquez Weavers, the richer by 40 years, the foreground vibrates in the myth of the alcove, where helmeted Minerva, before a tapestry of Titian's Europa, blights overweening Arachne. While in music, the noble falls of Frescobaldi's aria spread over Europe. Swelling the cadences of the Spanish heart, and in the rhyme flexed grandeur of Calderon's La Vida es Sueño, 1635, my life stands in the level of your dreams. Substance is secured, as in Descartes, by a method of doubt which seems its negation. Like beggar sly taken in drink to be a lord, Sigismondo, oracle-haunted prince, who knows only a mountain prison, is conveyed in sleep to the palace as heir. He breaks into the predicted passions and is returned to wake in his rock fastness. De todos era señor, y de todos me vengaba. Sola una mujer amaba, que fue verdad, creo yo. En que todo se acabó, y esto solo no se acaba. I was lord of all, and I took vengeance on all. I loved only one, a woman, and that was true, I believe, for the rest has faded away. This only does not fade. But it is just the conviction of insubstantiality. What is life but a frenzy? What is life but a cheat? It is a shadow, a story, and the greatest goods are not great. For we dream that we are dreaming in a life that is dream throughout. Que es la vida? Un frenesí. Que es la vida? Una ilusión. Una sombra. Una ficción. Y el mayor bien es pequeño, que toda la vida es sueño, y los sueños, sueños son. Which brings him by a leap, like Pascal's wager, to value and nobleness. I say that I am dreaming, and that I wish to do well, since good deeds are not lost, even in dream. Que estoy soñando, y que quiero obrar bien, pues no se pierde el hacer bien aun en sueños. Fit that Velasquez's masterpiece, alone in a small room in the Prado, can be viewed in a mirror, since the artist looks out, painting the real reflection in which the king turns as he leaves the room, another picture of him with the queen, glowing as in a lesser mirror, while the proud painter before our eyes lifts a peep-show court into world subjectivity. Perhaps Velasquez's dream is most mysterious in the Villa Medici landscapes, that Cartesian dream of noble and reasoning substance transforming the world into thought, as Milton's friend and colleague Marvel did in his poem on a garden where all the flowers and trees do close to weave the garlands of repose. Meanwhile the mind, from pleasure less, withdraws into its happiness. The mind, that ocean where each kind does straight its own resemblance find, yet it creates, transcending these, far other worlds and other seas, annihilating all that's made to a green thought in a green shade. From Roman Villa to Religious North, Milton's life and Latinate art vault that span. But it was the dark light span of Europe, Rembrandt's Jeremiah foreseeing the fall of Jerusalem. So Calderon's Rosaura peers into the prison of Sigismund. 
The door, or tomb mouth rather, stands agape, and from its centre night is born, of inner dark engendered. Deste su centro nace la noche, pues la engendra dentro. Chains sound within, or Milton of melancholy, of Cerberus and blackest midnight born, in Stygian cave forlorn, find out some uncouth cell where brooding darkness spreads his jealous wings. Here the phenomenal, later to appear the determinist outcast of Cartesian cleavage, is still felt, dreamed, and held, an overflow of God-filled consciousness, its light and darkness palpable, its heightened oppositions reasoned and will-wrought into one. That heroics of the tactile baroque the French share in a classical phase. As when Poussin in Rome wills from Raphael and Titian tableaus Racine might stage or French lutenists resound, a style to which Milton relates in the Renaissance love of his youth at Horton, conjuring Lycidas from Latin, Greek, and Sanazzaro return Sicilian muse, and call the veils, and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues. Ye valleys low, where the mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks, on whose fresh lap the swart star sparely looks, throw hither all your quaint enameled eyes. Bid Amaranthus all his beauty shed, and daffodillies fill their cups with tears to strew the laureate hearse where Lycid lies. Ay me, whilst thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away, where'er thy bones are hurled, whether beyond the stormy Hebrides, where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visits the bottom of the monstrous world, or whether thou to our moist vows denied sleep'st by the fable of Belerus old, where the great vision of the guarded mount looks toward Namuncus and Bionus old. Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with Ruth, and, O oh, ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. Though in early Milton, as in all Baroque, the classical meets the contrary dark space of Rembrandt, the pedal organ of shite. <laughs> to love the high embowered roof with antique pillars massy proof and storied windows richly dight, casting a dim religious light. There let the pealing organ blow to the full-voiced choir below, in service high and anthems clear, as may with sweetness through mine ear dissolve me into ecstasies and bring all heaven before mine eyes. Though what more suggests Rembrandt's 1631 Simeon Temple, Oriental, Renaissance, Baroque, revolted out of Gothic, comes later in Milton, when the fallen angels by organ pipe moles Breathe such a temple from the gold-ribbed soil of hell. Anon out of the earth a fabric huge rose like an exhalation, with the sound of dulcet symphonies and voices sweet, built like a temple where pilasters round were set, and Doric pillars overlaid with golden architrave. What are the time-space reaches of Milton's fabric huge? Reason, he said, is but choosing. His was the first to shape as from veins of liquid fire an entire world, creation to judgment, with theology, philosophy, poem and plot, even the suspensions of syntax and light and shade deployments of style from the sensorium of inner power and in resonance with the dark might of his own time and personal trial. Symbolic history takes perspective in his words, Egypt, 
not Babylon, nor great Al Cairo, such magnificence equaled in all their glories, when Egypt with Assyria strove in wealth and luxury. Though the monuments for Milton lie under sacred shadow, Locusts warping on the eastern wind that o'er the realm of impious Pharaoh hung like night and darkened all the land of Nile. So when Satan shows Christ the kingdoms of the world, there Babylon, the wonder of all tongues, as ancient but rebuilt by him who twice, Judah and all thy father David's house led captive, and Jerusalem laid waste, till Cyrus set them free. In that palace Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall at the feast Rembrandt magnifies, he like Milton hammering the tyranny and luxury of the East into one biblical bullion. High on a throne of royal state, which far outshone the wealth of Ormus and of Vient, or where the gorgeous east with richest hand showers on her king's barbaric pearl and gold, Satan exalted sat, by merit raised to that bad eminence. Till Cyrus set them free, Persepolis his city, there thou seest, now Persia, the tyranny that had freed the Jews, turned on the other race who in Miltonic tension held the love and loyalty of the West. Xerxes, the liberty of Greece to yoke, over Hellespont bridging his way, Europe with Asia joined, and scourged with many a stroke the indignant waves. Symbolic assault, Asia, Moloch and all, as when a vulture on Emmaus bred, ravening where on the Aegean shore a city stands, built nobly, pure the air and light the soil, Athens, the eye of Greece, mother of arts and eloquence. It had been the goal of his travels. When I was preparing to pass over into Sicily and Greece, the melancholy intelligence which I received of the civil commotions in England made me alter my purpose, for I thought it base to be travelling for amusement abroad, while my fellow citizens were fighting for liberty at home. Recalled from that journey, he would address the Areopagitica as to the assembly of free Athens, where books and wits were ever busier than in any other part of Greece. It is always those Greeks and Romans, the objects of our admiration. Nor can it do more than heighten the Blakean puzzle of the poet's tie to Satan, that the tempter in paradise lost, as when of old some orator renowned in Athens or free Rome, where eloquence flourished since mute, to some great cause addressed, stood in himself collected, while each part, motion, each act, won audience ere the tongue, sometimes in height began, as no delay of preface brooking through his zeal of right persuades Eve, since in the second defense Milton so addresses the revolutionary world. I imagine myself, not in the forum or on the rostra, surrounded only by the people of Athens or of Rome, but from the columns of Hercules to the Indian Ocean, I behold the nations of the earth recovering that liberty which they so long had lost. Milton knew the complexity of that loss. As cruel Tiberius would wish, when I die, let the earth be rolled in flames. This emperor hath no son, and now is old, old and lascivious, and from Rome retired to Capriae. With purpose there his hurried lusts in private to enjoy, his throne now made a star of which Christ tells the cause, that people, victor once, now vile and base, deservedly made vassal, who once just, frugal and mild, and temperate, conquered well, but govern ill the nations under yoke. Now it is Marcus Aurelius opposing Christian faith with pagan self-control, vain wisdom all, and false philosophy. The Stoic last, in philosophic pride, by him called virtue and his virtuous man, wise, perfect in himself, contemning all wealth, pleasure, pain or torment, death and life, ignorant of themselves, of God much more, and how the world began and how man fell, degraded by himself, on grace depending. 
But corruption had begun with the church itself, that universal terror of impurity Milton attacks in his church discipline. There is nothing wanting but Constantine to reign, and then tyranny herself shall give up all her citadels into your hands, aspiring bishops, as if the heavenly city could not support itself without the props and buttresses of secular authority. With Constantine's wealth, Antichrist began to put forth his horns. Formerly, saith Sulpicius, martyrdom by glorious death was sought more greedily than now bishoprics by vile ambition are hunted after. On the papal empire, Dante and Milton would blame, yet love its arts. This Lateran baptistry, often renewed, gilded Roman still. Fell the Germans, pushed by the horse nomads of the steppes, a multitude like which the populous north poured never from her frozen loins to pass rain or the Danau, when her barbarous sons came like a deluge on the south and spread beneath Gibraltar to the Libyan sand. The Dark Age metaphor of hellish legions loud with the organ voice. Neither Milton nor his age thought much of Gothic Christianity, Babylonian idolatry of creed captive grace. Wolves shall succeed for teachers, grievous wolves, who all the sacred mysteries of heaven to their own vile advantages shall turn of lucre and ambition, and the truth with superstitions and traditions taint. The same grim wolf with privy paw his youth had threatened with that two-handed engine at the door, though his art soul espoused those storied windows and the studious cloisters pale. What he had treasured most from Gothic was chivalry, in fable or romance of Uther's son begirt with British and Amoric knights. From the Latin demonis, we know that around 1639, when Rubens gathered this late fruit of the same vine, Milton's planned epic, in the vein of Ariosto and Spencer, was to have celebrated the matter later scorned in Paradise Lost, not sedulous by nature to indict wars heroic deemed, or to dissect with long and tedious havoc fabled knights in battles feigned. And, of course, it was within the late Gothic, attested by almost any parish church of England or Wales, that the humanization began which Milton ties to Chaucer's parson and to the man who, after so many dark ages, first broke the huge overshadowing train of error. And had it not been the obstinate perverseness of our prelates against the divine and admirable spirit of Wycliffe to suppress him as a schismatic and innovator, perhaps neither the Bohemian Huss and Jerome, no, nor the name of Luther or of Calvin had ever been known, the glory of reforming all our neighbours had been completely ours. Since for Milton, even now, in the reforming of reformation itself, what does God do but reveal himself as his manner is first to his Englishman? At the same time, that other motion reached the height which made Renaissance Florence the Athens of the Western world. Milton writes of the 1638 visit which produced his glowing Italian poems. In that city, which I have always most esteemed for the elegance of its dialect, its genius and its taste, I stopped about two months. It was fall. What memories later crowded upon him, thick as autumnal leaves that strew the brooks in Vallombrosa, where the Etrurian shades high overarched embower. And the moon, whose orb through optic glass the Tuscan artist views at evening from the top of Fiesole, or in Valdano to descry new lands, rivers or mountains in her spotty globe. No time will ever abolish the agreeable recollections which I cherish of Jacob Gaddi, Carlo Dati, Frescobaldo, and many others. On his way home, I got safe back to Florence, where I was received with as much affection as if I had returned to my native country. 
Yet those men must have been politic shadows of the free humanity that spearheaded the Renaissance two centuries before. Corruption had been swift. The Medici pawns of 16th century French and Spanish rule suggest the villainies of Jacobean drama, revenge's tragedy, the white devil. Such the Neapolitan who protested that his civility had been restrained by Milton's speaking with so little reserve on matters of religion. Michelangelo had flexed his might against that slipperiness. How could Milton, before the Sistine Judgment, but catch the battle roll of his own heroic verse, ancient liberty recovered from the troublesome bondage of rhyming? Rocks, caves, lakes, fens, bogs, dens, and shades of death, a universe of death which God by curse created evil, for evil only good, where all life dies, death lives, and nature breeds perverse, all monstrous, all prodigious things, abominable, inutterable, and worse than fables yet have feigned or fear conceived, gorgons and hydras and chimeras dire. Though Milton is a century beyond Michelangelo in that baroque loading which was gathering head, from the Gothic precision of Giotto and Ars Nova, hear my show. A clarity in which Dante's hell circles share those sharp man and snake transformations in the bulger of thieves, even the glowing masks of the city of Dees incised, red as if come from the fire. From that to the cloud-swallowed depths of Rubens and Schütz. That darkness visible, King James rhetoric, Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever, had prepared for Milton's vast Typhian rage. Seest thou yon dreary plain, forlorn and wild, the seat of desolation void of light, save what the glimmering of these livid flames casts pale and dreadful. Thither let us tend from off the tossing of these fiery waves. The energy climax before that thickening marks the Spain of El Greco and Lope de Vega, bound in opposite likeness with Shakespeare's England, against that pitchy cloud of infernal darkness where we shall never more hear the bird of morning sing. Milton lords in the closing prayer of his church discipline the felicity of this Britannic empire with all her daughter islands about her that we may still remember in our solemn thanksgivings how for us the northern ocean, even to the frozen Thule, was scattered with the proud shipwrecks of the Spanish Armada, and the very maw of hell ransacked and made to give up her concealed destruction ere she could vent it in that horrible and damned blast. <laughs> And indeed, beside Counter-Reformation Spain, there is an airy freedom to Elizabeth's England, where Milton's father wrote a madrigal for the Oriana triumphs of the Queen. Though already the family humor seems moral, what lies those ladies led? I was born, Milton wrote in the second defense, at a time when the virtue of my fellow citizens, far exceeding that of their progenitors in greatness of soul and vigor of enterprise, had succeeded in delivering the commonwealth from the most grievous tyranny and religion from the most ignominious degradation. 
the pose and face of Philip Sidney over Hampton Court should not impugn his fiery quality, nor the lightness of a bird pavan, its magnitude of soul. Those great 16th century mansions, long leaked in its Wiltshire Park, carry their richness with a lightsome grace. And there is truth in what Milton wrote, even of the Titan Shakespeare. If sweetest Shakespeare, fancy's child, warbled his native wood notes wild. Though there was a darkening around 1600, even for Shakespeare. From the mansions that dot the island, take any built or rebuilt under the Stuarts. This westward house, now broken into flats, the assertive portals and curves of Milton's century creep in. And if we advance through the same years in a sequence of pavans, we experience such a densening gravity of sound. Thus, from Bird to his pupil Tompkins, though we could cite as well Cooper, Daring, Ferrabosco. Towered cities please us then, and the busy hum of men, where throngs of knights and barons bold in weeds of peace high triumphs hold, with store of ladies. Not only that L'Allegro, but Milton's courtly mask, Comus, presented at Ludlow Castle in 1634, with parts taken by the lady daughter and Viscount sons of the Earl, seats the poet in chivalric pride, as of Hatfield House and the stately Pathan. As surely as his early poetry mellows from Shakespeare, the sounds and seas with all their finny drove now to the moon in wavering morris move and on the tawny sands and shelves trip the pert fairies and the dappled elves as the pavan in tompkins receives a chromatic burden milton suffuses shakespeare's clear chalice with conscious touch night hath better sweets to brew Venus now wakes and wakens love. On the exposed continent, the Baroque flexing is stronger. Against Oliver's Sydney, even the lightest early Rubens, 1609, the artist with his first bride, deploys formulable masses. So the North German shite concretizes the pavan. And in whatever gossamer of fabric and light, the old Rubens wraps his young Elaine and their son. We note, as with Scheidt's tonal rhetoric on the same chromatic motif, a weighty change of state as from air to earth. Meanwhile, in the London of Milton's youth, Inigo Jones, launching Palladio toward the proportionate hopes of 18th century, framed the perfection of the Queen's house in Greenwich. At the same time, English song, in quiet harmony with Caccini and Peri, moved from Dowland's fullness of late Renaissance. <laughs> To the word-matched baroque of Law's Comus settings, Harry, whose tuneful and well-measured song. I was there with you that bore What was the order of the spanks that bore Flowers of what mingled you And of her blood scarf and shore Hells of my 
With the ease of Inigo Jones' spiral stair, that England mounts from Renaissance past toward enlightened and romantic future, as gradually as ground bass harmony infilters the retrospection of the English vile fantasy. From Byrd and Gibbons, through William Laws and Jenkins, to Locke and Purcell, as great a body of music as exists. Jenkins, most of all, quietly writing throughout Milton's life, sounds what is called for in L'Allegro. And ever against eating cares, lap me in soft Lydian airs, married to immortal verse, such as the meeting soul may pierce in notes, with many a winding bout of linked sweetness long drawn out, with wanton heed and giddy cunning, the melting voice through mazes running. Untwisting all the chains that tie the hidden soul of harmony. And in the visual music of Christ Church Stair at Oxford, the fan vault of Tudor Gothic is revived for the palatial wreathing of 1630. So William Laws, killed fighting for the king against Milton's party, magnifies taverners in nomine. But in rugged boldness, these six-part consorts rival the expanse of Rubens. Even bookish Milton claimed that Bruegel earth, while the ploughman near at hand whistles o'er the furrowed land, and the milkmaid singeth blithe, and the mower wets his scythe, and every shepherd tells his tale under the hawthorn in the dale. From polyphonic Rubens, organized all over the canvas, each part and detail a picture of its own. To the obelisk of Rembrandt, centered in the vortex of light against shade, is such a shift as Milton's from the genial amble of L'Allegro to the controlled enormity of Paradise Lost, structured like a single sentence from opening theme to final vindication. Long is the way and hard that out of hell leads up to light. As glowing, a clair obscure, as Milton's landscape metaphor, when the fallen angels break up their conclave, as when from mountain tops the dusky clouds ascending, while the north wind sleeps, o'er spread heaven's cheerful face, the lowering element scowls o'er the darkened landscape, snow or shower. If chance the radiant sun with farewell sweet extend his evening beam, the fields revive, the birds their notes renew, and bleating herds attest their joy that hill and valley rings. Yet in music, Baroque so blends polyphony and ground bass that Miltonic and tenebrous might attends both. Thus a polyphonic fantasy by Matthew Locke.
against a German ground-based sonata of about 1670 with Ruisdale. That which purifies us, says Milton, is trial, and trial is by what is contrary. Contrary as a Puritan's sensuous love for Catholic art. From Tasso's Gabriel, time of this Veronese, who shook his wings with Rory Maydew's wet, Fairfax, through Crashaw's Marini, heaven's golden-winged herald late he saw to a poor Galilean virgin sent, how low the bright youth bowed, and with what awe immortal flowers to her fair hand present, comes the messenger of Milton's nativity ode, with turtle wing the amorous clouds dividing, and waving wide her myrtle wand, she strikes a universal peace through sea and land. De Cavalieri's oratorio of soul and body saved and damned, Caracci's Saint Anthony tempted and blessed, where heaven fronts Tasso's opulent devils, he looked like huge Tifoyus loosed from hell, again to shake heaven's everlasting frame, as inflated by Marini, his eyes the sullen dens of death and night, where a dark drove of dragons, hydras, sphinxes fill the grove. To that baroque contrast, Milton, even before his Italian travels, gave its lushest cognate. The lonely mountains o'er and the resounding shore, a voice of weeping heard and loud lament. From haunted spring and dale, edged with poplar pale, the parting genius is with sighing sent. With flower in woven tresses torn, the nymphs in twilight shade of tangled thickets mourn. Since our babe to show his Godhead true can in his swaddling bands control the damned crew. And all about the courtly stable, bright harnessed angels sit in order serviceable. There would be no Milton without such clandestine caress, Caravaggio, Marini, Monteverdi. The sensuous as never before, Eve reflected in the pool. A murmuring sound of waters issued from a cave and spread into a liquid plain. I thither went and laid me down to look into the clear, smooth lake that to me seemed another sky. A shape within the watery gleam appeared through art's a soft Italian touch. As through Bernini's Monsignor's, Milton sought the strength for which Wordsworth would invoke him. Thou shouldst be living at this hour. England hath need of thee. On his tour, declaring his faith to the composed and weary magnanimity of the Italian. Chiabrera was writing of Columbus. 
Great souls chosen for a glorious work in their elected labor take delight, nor can the petty curb of common blame deflect the noble from the path of fame. But it was safe to praise Columbus. What of Campanella, long in prison for a grandeur like Milton's own? Since power and knowledge cannot move, but as love fire the will, that trinity I praise and ever shall, the primal one of wisdom, power, and love. Urban the Eighth was Pope. Bernini carved him the year of Milton's visit. In the Areopagitica, the Italy of that face becomes an argument against censorship. Their learned men did nothing but bemoan the servile condition into which learning amongst them was brought, that this was it which had damped the glory of Italian wits, that nothing had been there written now these many years but flattery and fustian. There it was that I found and visited the famous Galileo grown old, a prisoner to the Inquisition, for thinking in astronomy otherwise than the Franciscan and Dominican licensers thought. The Scots revolted against the prayer book, and Milton returned to an England where flattery of high church and state swelled the new art of the balanced couplet. So the famous Walla, who attained, as they said, in his eighteenth year a style which will perhaps never be obsolete, inflated Prince Charles' 1621 sea danger to almost the height of fustian that Rubens bestowed on Marie de' Medici, Queen Mother of France. Now had his highness bid farewell to Spain and reached the sphere of his own power, the main. Five years later, Walla hailed what proved a naval disaster. Where'er thy navy spreads her canvas wings, homage to thee and peace to all she brings. In Milton's words, the trencher fury of a rhyming parasite. Rubens' pupil Van Dyck was at the court painting cavaliers. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Shall I, wasting in despair, die because a woman's fair? If she be not fair to me, what care I how fair she be? And why so pale and wan, fond lover? Prithee, why so pale? If when looking well can't move her, looking ill prevail? Now the irony of Lycidas, were it not better done as others use, to sport with Amaryllis in the shade, or with the tangles of Neera's hair, turns in the pamphlets to attack what flows at waste from the pen of some vulgar amorist. Whether or not by Rembrandt, the searching man with a book defends with Albert the other side, Evangel against Cavalier, reenacting on the expanded stage the Florentine rift of a century and a half before between Medici and Savonarola. And now Milton, with the prose he called his left hand, took up the trumpet to blow a dolorous, jarring blast. Read any books whatever come to thy hands, for thou art sufficient both to judge aright and to examine each matter. Truth is a streaming fountain. If her waters flow not in a perpetual progression, they sicken into a muddy pool of conformity and tradition. A man may be a heretic in the truth, and though his belief be true, yet the very truth he holds becomes his heresy. Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience, above all liberties. Methinks I see in my mind a noble and puissant nation, rousing herself like a strong man after sleep, 
and shaking her invincible locks, methinks I see her as an eagle mewing her mighty youth, and kindling her undazzled eyes at the full midday beam, purging and unscaling her long abused sight at the fountain itself of heavenly radiance, while the whole noise of timorous and flocking birds, with those also that love the twilight, flutter about, amazed at what she means, and in their envious gabble would prognosticate a year of sects and schisms. Rembrandt also, in his prime, celebrated the god of his Dutch Republic, turning the usual portrait row into a sect of one search for the dissevered body of truth. What blind gabbling it too must have occasioned for all who lacked the trust which is Milton's axiom of freedom. Who knows not that truth is strong next to the Almighty? A faith hard to hold through the fury that greeted those pamphlets of free church, free state, free marriage. The cleansing of the temple had become a symbol for reform and counter-reform. Thus with El Greco, or with the 1626 Rembrandt, Compare the violence of Milton's sonnet. I did but prompt the age to quit their clogs by the known rules of ancient liberty, when straight a barbarous noise environs me of owls and cuckoos, asses, apes, and dogs, as when those hinds that were transformed to frogs railed at Latona's twin-born progeny, which after held the sun and moon in fee. But this is got by casting pearl to hogs that bawl for freedom in their senseless mood and still revolt when truth would set them free. License they mean when they cry liberty, for who loves that must first be wise and good. But from that mark how far they rove we see for all this waste of wealth and loss of blood. But if men are such brawling hogs as Bosch had painted them a century before Rembrandt, how is the temple to be cleansed? The peasant war had led Luther from Christian freedom to revolutionary reversal. Reason must be deluded, blinded, and destroyed. So Hobbes, Milton's older contemporary, by a Machiavellian materialism of motive and a logic of atomic reduction, proves that men cannot, like bees, find natural agreement, but must snatch at artificial covenant against greed, hatred, and the condition of war of every man against every man. Thus nothing but the satanic leviathan of unquestioned tyranny prevents the contrary worst, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. But though Milton would repeat in Paradise Lost the passionate servitude of the fallen, true liberty is lost, which always with right reason dwells, and in Paradise regained, how to free these thus degenerate, by themselves enslaved, it did not undermine his search for the ready and easy way to establish a free commonwealth. The Messiah of Paradise Regained has dreamed of liberation to subdue proud, tyrannic power till truth were freed and equity restored. Not all the Nimrod hunt of war on each hand slaughter and gigantic deeds scattered with carcasses and arms the ensanguined field, estranged Cromwell's Latin secretary from the cause, only the manifest danger of freedom's turning on itself. O oh, citizens, if after being released from the toils of war you neglect the arts of peace, your peace will be only a more distressing war. Your very bowels will be continually teeming with an intolerable progeny of tyrants. And to Cromwell, here in Samuel Cooper's miniature, if you, who have hitherto been the tutelary genius of liberty, should hereafter invade that liberty which you have defended, a most destructive blow will be leveled against the happiness of mankind. Help us to save free conscience from the paw of hireling wolves whose gospel is their maw. 
Against the temptations of his place, Cromwell tried to deserve the praise of that sonnet, our chief of men, repeatedly exhorting Parliament in Miltonic words. Is it ingenuous to ask liberty and not to give it? What greater hypocrisy than for those who were oppressed by the bishops to become oppressors themselves? So ends what Thoreau would call the last significant scrap of news from England, though much continued under the pomp of restoration. Now the blind regicide unhanged returned to his lonely epic task, as if through the parcel of trumpet display we should hear the dying falls of those da Gamba fantasies with which his composing began. and be drawn back to the tenebrist weight of Rembrandt and of Milton, like his own Noah, the only son of light in a dark age, as Wordsworth would take it up, uttering odious truth, darkness before and danger's voice behind, soul awful, if the earth has ever lodged an awful soul. But did even Milton shun one truth, that a god of the absolute, who reasons as Pope would quip, like a school divine against the quest of knowledge claimed in the Areopagitico, has no choice but to retire and put not forth his goodness, while Satan takes up the suppressed resolve not to crook the servile knee and sing forced hosannas, what though the field be lost, all is not lost, the unconquerable will. Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. The whole of Baroque exhibits willful arrogation and Milton overweens more than the vaunters of Bernini outwardness. As heroic couplet Dryden is reported, this man cuts us all out, and the ancients too. No doubt he must pay the cost of proud command. But that he shares with Rembrandt, whom moderns more and more esteem, while everybody from pound down knocks Milton, righteous pole of the western big top. It seems that against Rembrandt, Milton suffered some repressive closure, as if the soul body and moral war had made a battleground of his heart. We have said he was the first to rear a universe from the imminence of self. Was he not also the last? Since no one after could conceive himself on every front of thought, poetry, politics, an instrument of God's final purpose in the world. The later God possessed, Goethe, Hölderlin, Hegel, Whitman, inherit divided realms. The owl of Minerva flies only in the deepening dusk. But to control so much and lose love's center raises the Gerontian question, after such knowledge, what forgiveness? Even the Areopagitica grounds strength on the test of no. He that can apprehend and consider vice with all her baits and seeming pleasures and yet abstain. That denial becomes the crux of Milton's works. Perhaps only Michelangelo, in the Florentine cleavage of Medici and Savonarola, had set abandonment so voluptuously against itself. This Bacchus of his youth, fattening the soil for Comus, to roll with pleasure in a sensual sty. 
Within the navel of this hideous wood, immured in cypress shades, a sorcerer dwells, of Bacchus and of Circe born, great Comus, and here to every thirsty wanderer, by sly enticement gives his baneful cup. How can Milton build but with the passion the restrainer, as Blake says, stole from the abyss? Comus, wherefore did nature pour her bounties forth with such a full and unwithdrawing hand and set to work millions of spinning worms that in their green shops weave the smooth-haired silk to deck her sons? But all that energy, midnight shout and revelry, tipsy dance and jollity, braid your locks with rosy twine, dropping odors, dropping wine, subsists in Comus under the disapprobation and animadversion of lean and sallow abstinence. The wanted roar was up amidst the woods and filled the air with barbarous dissonance. From the Bacchic art of Titian, through the Mannerist Ballet of 1600, these nymphs of the chase at the transformation of Acteon, down to the fleshy rapes of Rubens, or Poussin's formality of touch, it is hard to find a foreclosure like Milton's, from the mild prudery of Lycidas, rough satyrs danced, and fawns with cloven heel from the glad sound would not be absent long, to the paradise lost excoriations of Stuart license, and in luxurious cities where the noise of riot ascends above their loftiest towers, and injury and outrage, and when night darkens the streets, then wander forth the sons of Belial, flown with insolence and wine, witness the streets of Sodom but drive far off the barbarous dissonance of Bacchus and his revelers, the race of that wild rout that tore the Thracian bard. Against that inversion set the Elizabethan, Wilkes Madrigal, in the Oriana collection to which Milton's father had contributed. Whether this music belongs to the swirl of late Renaissance or deploys, as might almost seem, the weight of Rubens' first baroque, its force is life-affirming. <laughs> The close of Comus tries to validate a festive joy, to triumph in victorious dance, or sensual folly and intemperance. But the staid lady and youths mince it in an earth cumbered, the winged air darked with plumes. In post-Renaissance Christendom, the conscious validation of flesh may overween. Shakespeare's a green goose, a goddess. As Blanchard, with Cartesian touch, strokes Ariosto's erring Angelica. Milton inflates the sensual as man's imparadising claim. Half her swelling breast naked met his under the flowing gold of her loose tresses hid. He in delight smiled with superior love. 
nor turned, I ween, Adam from his fair spouse, nor Eve the rites mysterious of connubial love refused. Whatever hypocrites austerely talk, hail wedded love. The very angel glows rosy red when Adam asks how spirits mix by touch. Christianity had fought the brush fire of sex since before the Coptic relief of an angel contending against Leda and the Swan. But neither in the catacombs nor in the early Middle Ages, pneumatic Eve deflated to angular skin bags, nor in the dream romance of that Eve at Autun is the fall sexualized. Even the force forms of Michelangelo, Eve and crotch athwart the conspicuous male, keep body clean. It seems to go with the Protestant tending north that Marbuse's 1525 torrid eve reaches for both fruits at the same time. But this is fablo comic. Milton's reason does not smile. Against his better knowledge, not deceived, but fondly overcome with female charm. As with new wine intoxicated both they swim in mirth, And fancy that they feel divinity within them breeding wings, Wherewith to scorn the earth, but that false fruit far other operation first displayed, Carnal desire enflaming. In Rembrandt, touch raises the same danger, by a verism almost grotesque, he dodges, though the light on what Milton will call those mysterious parts, flirts the bait the poet devours. There they their fill of love and love's disport took largely, of their mutual guilt the seal, the solace of their sin, till dewy sleep oppressed them, wearied with their amorous play. As Rembrandt knew, Jove's coming to deny in a shower of gold had become a symbol of bought love, the same which Milton opposed to the hailed connubial. Not in the bought smile of harlots, loveless, joyless, unendeared, casual fruition, nor in court amours. The leaning Cupid Elliot would take up, from which a golden Cupidon peeped out weeps and wrings his hands, but the Olympian glow of the natural body makes Adams to the nuptial bower. I led her blushing like the morn, mawkishly unclean. Was Milton's luck with Eros so poor? Let this unknown English lady take us back to 1643, when the poet left his house and pupils to return with a 17-year-old wife from the royalist stronghold of Oxford. She fled to her family in a few days. Milton wrote The Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce. It may yet befall a discreet man to be mistaken in his choice. The soberest and best governed men are least practised in these affairs. Many who have spent their youth chastely, while they haste so eagerly to light the nuptial torch, may easily chance to meet, if not with a body impenetrable, yet often with a mind to all other due conversation inaccessible. Nay, instead of being one flesh, they will be rather two carcasses chained unnaturally together, or, as it may happen, a living soul bound to a dead corpse. Only when the royalist cause was ruined, and Milton was in high place, did the girl, father and all, rejoin the household. It was long after Mary Powell's death that Adam lectures hapless Eve. He never shall find out fit mate, but such as some misfortune brings him or mistake, which infinite calamity shall cause to human life and household peace confound. Or Samson, Delilah, to break all faith, all vows, deceive, betray, then as repentant to submit, beseech, if in my flower of youth and strength, when all men loved, honoured, feared me, thou alone could hate me, thy husband, slight me, sell me, and forego me, how wouldst thou use me now, blind? Milton had a second wife who died in childbirth after fifteen months. This is not a portrait of her, though of that time. Already England could foreshadow the human immediacies of Jane Austen. 
Methought I saw my late espoused saint brought to me like Alcestis from the grave. But, oh, as to embrace me she inclined, I waked, she fled, and day brought back my night. Despite the second wife or the serviceable third, denial holds the center. Not only Comus is founded on the yet abstain of the Areopagitica. In Paradise Lost, it is Satan to Eve. Die by the fruit, it gives you life to knowledge. In Paradise Regained, Satan to Christ. All men are sons of God, I also both trials requiring the prejudged negative. Not even Samson can fulfill his mission without once more fencing his ears against Delilah's sorceries. No wonder Blake had to revive that ruined man from the polyp of Uro that he might break the chain of jealousy from all its roots. The glory of the great Baroque is also its misplaced concreteness as if the radiant universe of besold transcendence could be grasped in the spatial causality and fugal syntax of assertive non-contradiction. So Bacon, Locke and Newton deify, as Blake saw it, the vegetable glass of nature. So he wrote, in Milton the father is destiny, the son a ratio of the five senses, and the Holy Ghost vacuum. But of Milton only could Blake add, in warring identification, he was a true poet, and of the devil's party without knowing it. In Paradise Lost, in Claude, in Purcell, is it bondage or transcendence when thought down tensile fields gropes the new syntax of consciousness? Sweet is the breath of morn, her rising sweet, with charm of earliest birds, pleasant the sun when first on this delightful land he spreads his orient beams on herb, tree, fruit, and flower, glistering with dew. Fragrant the fertile earth after soft showers, and sweet the coming on of grateful evening mild, then silent night with this her solemn bird, and this fair moon, and these the gems of heaven, her starry train. But neither breath of morn when she ascends with charm of earliest birds, nor rising sun on this delightful land, nor herb, fruit, flower, glistering with dew, nor fragrance after showers, nor grateful evening mild, nor silent night with this her solemn bird, nor walk by moon, nor glittering starlight, without thee is sweet. After Purcell's fantasy on one note, the polyphony of searching modulation finds a last controlled amplitude in the Ricciacari the old Bach wrote on King Frederick's tune. So the Miltonic simile reaches out and rounds on itself, his legions, thick as autumnal leaves in Vallombrosa, or scattered sedge afloat when Orion hath vexed the Red Sea coast, whose waves o'erthrew Bucyrus and his Memphian chivalry, 
while they pursued the sojourners of Goshen, who beheld carcasses and broken chariot wheels, so thick bestrewn, abject and lost lay these. Thus the inversion and stretch of the opening sentence of man's first disobedience, with all hanging clauses and phrases, and of whose, into, and with, of, till, and sing heavenly muse, mirrors the long inversion and quest of the poem until the angel at the close melts history into divine plan. O oh, goodness infinite, that all this good of evil shall produce, more wonderful than that by which creation first brought forth light out of darkness. And as Christ had said in Book 3, Thou wilt not leave me in the loathsome grave. Now all the stars of morn see him rise, fresh as the dawning light. And as Lycidas, after grief and blessing, returns to today and tomorrow calm, thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, while the still morn went out with sandals gray. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. So Paradise Lost settles from the deep passions of Rembrandt into the elegiac peace of Poussin and Claude, which had always paired in Milton with tenebrist might. This late and luminous Claude, Hagar banished into silver grey. We may no longer stay. Go, wake an eve. From the other hill the cherubim descended gliding meteorous as evening mist risen from a river or the marish glides in either hand the hastening angel caught our lingering parents and to the eastern gate led them direct and down the cliff as fast to the subjected plain then disappeared they looking back all the eastern side beheld of paradise, so late their happy seat, waved over by that flaming brand, the gate with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest, and providence their guide. They, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden took their solitary way. Milton had always thought, along with the epic of the drama, wherein Sophocles and Euripides reign, and as Rembrandt in his last year felt his way into the return of the prodigal, Milton took up, like a suffering of his own, the blind trial and death victory of Samson. O oh, loss of sight, of thee I most complain, blind among enemies, O oh, worse than chains, dungeon or beggary or decrepit age, O oh, dark, 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 amid the blaze of noon, Irrecoverably dark, total eclipse, without all hope of day. The sun to me is dark, and silent as the moon, when she deserts the night, hid in her vacant interlunar cave. As in the Oedipus Colonus of Sophocles, the death of the hero leads the chorus beyond tragedy. Nothing is here for tears, nothing to wail or knock the breast, no weakness, no contempt, dispraise or blame, nothing but well and fair. And what may quiet us in a death so noble? As Spinoza knew, that is the only form tragedy can take in the eternal rightness of reason. It is the nature of reason to conceive things under the species of eternity. 
that is, intellectual love toward God, is part of the infinite love with which God loves himself. But Spinoza's love, like the last self-portrait of the dying Rembrandt, may go beyond that egotism which, to add a word to Coleridge, is a somber revelation of spirit. In the formulated pride of Baroque, where Rembrandt moved always to inclusion, did Milton, proudest of all, let selfhood exclude and foreclose? Or had Eve's, forsake me not thus, Adam, and true repentant tears be sold also for his blindness, the great wheel of right? All is best, though we oft doubt what the unsearchable dispose of highest wisdom brings about, and ever best found in the close. His servants he, with new acquist, of true experience from this great event, with peace and consolation hath dismissed, and calm of mind, all passion spent. <laughs>